this morning. You can find your place in Daniel chapter 9. We're going to look at verses 5 through 15. We've been examining the prayer of Daniel. Uh, We'll have one more week after this in this prayer, just a rich prayer that we find in Scripture from the lips of Daniel. We want to learn from it. The title of the message this morning is Confident Confession. Confident Confession. There was a a brief time after high school and before I went to college that I had the responsibility of being the nighttime closing manager at the grocery store I worked at. And uh, there in northern Wisconsin, where the store, where I grew up, where the store was located, um, the winters would get quite bitterly cold and very snowy. And uh, there was one particular winter night when it was fairly cold. I don't remember the exact temperature, but I think it was at least in the single digits, if not even below zero. I just remember it was quite cold that evening. I think there might have even been some snow in the air. definitely was snowy out. It was late, and there was a middle-aged man that came into the store to buy a few things. Um, It was just myself left in the store, as well as uh, the cashier. I don't know if there's any other employees at that time. If I remember right, we were getting near, closer to the end of closing. It was late. And, um, don't know the situation which brought him out, why he felt the need to come to the store that evening, but come to find out the, as he's you know, cash, uh, with a cashier checking out, fi- she finds out that this man had walked some, you know, it was probably like three miles into town to purchase these items. And she was concerned about his health, concerned about his safety on the trek back um, in the middle of the night, even the road that he's going to take, dark, no street lights, all of that. And so she called me up front and just shared her concerns. Well, northern Wisconsin, little town, we don't have a taxi service there. This is before Uber was a thing, okay? So <laughs> there was an Uber or Lyft. Uh, that really, for this man's safety, one of us were probably going to have to take him home. Well, she was the one that could run the till. She couldn't leave, but I was the manager, and I wasn't supposed to leave, right? I, I couldn't leave the store unless there was another manager. There wasn't. Well... I made a judgment call and said, you know what, for this man's safety, we don't really have any other options here. I will leave the store, take him to his home, and come back. I did that. Thankfully, nothing bad happened while I was gone. The (laughs) the store didn't implode. And uh, anyway, I get back, and the clerk that was on, she said, you know what? I won't tell anybody that you did that. She said, I'm not going to share that you did that. And basically it was like, you know what, upper management tomorrow, I'm not going to let them know you did that. She was willing to cover for me. And I shared with her, I did it. (laughs) I'm going to be the first one to tell upper management, this is what I did in case something comes out of it, right? So the reality is, though, in that moment, no one was probably going to ever know um, and if they did find out, the reality is I also had somebody who was going to vouch for me to say, no, that didn't happen. But the next day I shared with the store director what, what had taken place, reasoning why. And though he did strongly urge me never to do that again, thankfully there were no further repercussions from that. But the point's of this. I could have chosen to lie in that moment or, or, or not say anything at all. I even had someone who would help kind of fabricate for me so that I could, you know, kind of fly under the radar for this breach of policy. But instead, I chose to confess. I chose to be honest. I chose to admit, agree with reality, what actually happened. And that's what confession is. It's really to admit, it's to agree with what actually is. Truth, reality. We're continuing our series here in Daniel 7 through 12, entitled God's Supremacy, Our Hope in a Godless World. As I mentioned, we're looking again at Daniel's prayer here in Daniel chapter 9. And Daniel's praying over the sins of the nation of Israel. And here in this prayer, Daniel doesn't make any excuses. He doesn't try to hide the guilt of the nation or his own guilt. Instead, he simply agrees with the reality of their current situation from God's perspective. And as he prays, Daniel relies upon the righteousness, the mercy, the forgiveness, and even the blessings of God towards his people. So as we look at this prayer, 
we are going to be encouraged this morning to confess your sins to a merciful God. All right? This is what we're going to take away. We should be ready and quick to confess our sins because God's merciful. So quick reminder of the background. If you remember, you had uh, Babylon, mighty kingdom, and they were the world power that came in by God's divine allowance and overthrew Jerusalem and took God's people to be in exile from Judah into the land of Babylon. This was due to Israel's sin. They had wandered, they had gone their own way, and now they're in exile. Well, over the course of time, Babylon falls to the Medo-Persian Empire. Darius is set up as king in Babylon. So now you have this new political power in place, a new king. Yet God continues to be gracious to Daniel and gives Daniel a position of leadership within the Medo-Persian Empire. And Daniel's been studying scripture. Specifically, he's been studying the prophecies of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, in his prophecies that God had given him, uh, w- Daniel finds out that, yes, they were to be in exile, but God had a time frame, only temporarily. In fact, God had said that his people in Babylon would be there, and he had scheduled it for 70 years. So Daniel does the math about the time that they went into exile and to this point, and it's been about 66 years. So the time is drawing near for God to work mercifully and allow his people back to the promised land. So in response to God's word and God's promise that his people would be allowed to return, Daniel approaches God with his prayer of confession. And as we saw last week, Daniel approached God in humility. He prepared his heart by turning first his face to God. He even fasted and and sat in ashes in humility. And then, before even confessing, he praised God for God's greatness and goodness. Verse 4 He says, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. It's really good for our prayers to begin with that adoration. Really good for our prayers to begin with that praise. God alone deserves our praise. God alone deserves our dependence. And such praise only works to humble us. So Daniel is now humbled. So it's time to confess. Verses 15, or 5 through 15. Daniel confesses the sins of the nation. And as we listen into this prayer again, we're, we, we learn four ways that a prayer of confession must agree with God. Remember, confession agrees with God about the reality of the situation. There's four ways. First, we agree with God about our sin. Second, we agree with God about his judgment. Third, we agree with God about our path. And then fourth, we agree with God about his mercy. All right, so let's begin by looking at this first one. Confession agrees with God about our sin. Verses 5 and 6, Daniel says, we have sinned. Here's where he's starting this confession, this prayer of confession. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to the kings, our princes and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. So Daniel here begins to agree with God about the sin of Israel. And this is what it means to confess our sins before God. Confession is simply saying the same thing about our sin that God says about our sin. See, confession is, in, is where we admit that sin is serious. We take sin seriously before God. God. And we understand that God is holy and pure, and sin is serious. So Daniel here confesses the sin of Israel. Now this is a unique situation because God had made a covenant with the nation of Israel. This is unlike the situation we have found ourselves in as citizens of America. God has not made a covenant with the United States of America. All right? Uh, God has not uh, made a covenant that, w- that would say that we are going to prosper and that he is going to set a king over America for all eternity. We, we don't have those promises. All right? So Daniel's conf- confession here for the nation is unique. That doesn't mean that we can't confess or agree with God about the situation our nation is in 
nor does it mean that we can't, in fact, we should uh, pray for our nation and even call on God if it's will to have mercy upon our nation. But we are not confessing or repenting of sin in the same way that Daniel can for a nation that is under the promises of God. All right? Yet, the principles we find here instruct our personal confession of sin. Because, as believers, God has made a new covenant with us. There's forgiveness for his people. So look at how Daniel agrees with God about sin. All right, how does he do that? He describes sin in vivid details. And in verses 5 and 6, we just read, he uses six different expressions for sin. Number one, we've sinned. Number two, we've done wrong. Number three, we've acted wickedly. Number four, we've rebelled. Number five, we've turned aside. Number six, we have not listened. Sin. What does sin mean? Sin means literally to miss the mark. All right? That's a literal translation of that word. It's used for missing the mark. Some of our kids were playing. Well, all three of our kids were playing behind our house the other day. It was one of the warmer days. Summer is here-ish. And uh, they got out buckets of water and their water squirters and their water guns. And some of the other kids that were down the street came down. And so they set up a bucket on each side. And so kids, anytime you're in the water, whether you're playing with, you know, water squirters or water balloons, the whole goal is to hit your friend, right? Like, you don't want to waste that water just on the ground. You're going to try to get your friend soaked, And so while you were playing back there, sometimes you hit the mark, right? It's great when you can squirt your friend and get them soaked. And it's also great if you're playing with water balloons and you can, you know, land that correct shot, right? That's, That's hitting the mark. But sometimes you miss, right? And you miss the mark. You miss the target. You miss your friend. That's the picture of sin. Sin is missing that target. You have something to aim at, and you miss it, right? God has a standard. God has given us things that we should and should not do. His holiness is that standard, and if we do not follow his ways, if we go about doing our own things, it's like throwing a water balloon or shooting a water squirter and missing the mark. We, we miss what we're supposed to be doing, all right? So Daniel simply agrees with God that he, along with the nation of Israel, had missed the mark of God's law. All right? Now, Daniel is a righteous man, but he's not perfect. And he includes himself in this uh, prayer of confession. He's confessing his sins right along with the nation of Israel. He says, we've missed the mark of God's law. Now, God had given his law, his commands to the Israelites. They were clear commands. There was the Ten Commandments, was the summation of the law. But then God had also given many other laws for the nation of Israel. But the most important law was this one summarized in Deuteronomy 6, 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. The greatest commandment is to love, worship, and obey God. And the nation of Israel had missed that standard. They had missed that target in their sinfulness. They had forgotten the Lord. They had gone after false gods. And so they had missed the mark. They had sinned. But Daniel also says, we have done wrong. We have acted wickedly. We have rebelled. We've turned aside from your commandments and rules. And these four descriptions put that responsibility for sin upon Israel, upon Daniel, upon ourselves not upon God. See, Daniel doesn't blame others. He doesn't say, well, God, you know what? We probably wouldn't have gone that way if those pagan nations weren't still there or if that temptation didn't come in. He doesn't blame others. He doesn't blame God. He doesn't make these excuses. Instead, he simply says, we sinned. It was our choice to do so. Again, he's confessing his sin, right? And he's saying, it's nobody else's problem. It's mine. Done wrong. We are the ones who committed the sin. Acted wickedly. We knew what to do, but we chose to act upon that wickedness in our hearts. Rebelled. That's that purposeful saying no to God and going our own way. 
Rebellion is the prideful and audacious declaration that God, I know better than you. Right? I know your way. It's right there. It's clear. I like my way better. Mine's got to be better. I'm rebelling. I'm going my own way. And then he simply says, turn aside. The willing turning away from God and his commands. So each of these descriptions is simply a humble acknowledgement that our sin is really our own choice. We don't have anyone to blame but ourselves. God has made his way, his path, his commands clear. And when we sin, we just simply choose to go our own way, which is away from God. But there's this last one here in these two verses that Daniel uses to describe sin. And that is simply, we don't listen to God's word, right? Verse 6, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets. But he mentions it again down in verse 10. And he says, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. So Daniel admits that God's word was clear. He says, God didn't mumble. He didn't, you know, just give a, a few words and we have to kind of figure out what he means. Instead, Daniel admits that God's word was clear. We just simply didn't listen. We didn't heed. We didn't obey. We didn't do that. So to confess our sin, then, is to first to admit that our sin is indeed sin. All right? And, and, we'll, and we are saying that what is true about our sin is what we will agree to. We don't make excuses for it. We don't try to sugarcoat it. We're going to call it what it is. It is true that we chose our own path. It's true that we rebelled against God. No matter how small or big the sin that we committed must be confessed before God. Right? Might, it's easy to make excuses for those little sins, right? <laughs> no. It's still sin. We still chose to rebel against God. We bring it to be before God in humble repentance by agreeing with God about the nature and vileness of our sin. So in confessing our sins, we must agree with God about our sin. But second, we must also agree with God about his judgment. All right, so confession agrees with God about his judgment. Look at verses 7 through 8. Daniel prays this, To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness. But to us, open shame. He says here, we deserve shame. As at this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away, in all the lands to which you have driven them, because of the treachery that they have committed against you. We deserve shame because of our sin. To us, O Lord, belong what? Open shame to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned again against you. So twice in those two verses, Daniel admits that the nation of Israel should rightly feel shame over their sin. The humble heart experiences sorrow, guilt, and shame over sin. The Corinthian believers were a great example of those who had grieved over their sin. Paul had written a letter to them prior to 2 Corinthians that actually rebuked them for their sin. All right? The Corinthian church had many problems, and Paul was often rebuking them. Well, he sends a letter to rebuke them, and then he sends 2 Corinthians. And in 2 Corinthians 7, Paul actually rejoices over the repentant heart. We read this starting in verse 8 through verse 10. He says, For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting, for you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. When we are convicted, right? If you're a child of God, you sin. Conviction of the Holy Spirit comes. And through God's word or through the Holy Spirit, you're convicted. There is that godly sorrow, that godly grief that comes over you. And we can admit that, God, I deserve shame. 
right? Daniel says, we deserve, we are guilty, we deserve shame. We also, though, deserve judgment, verses 11 through 14. He goes on to say, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice, and the curse and the oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed his words, right? He's made them fast, which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. For under the whole heaven, there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept Right, ready the calamity and has brought it upon us for the Lord our God is what righteous in all his works that he has done and we have not obeyed his voice so in this confession we see Daniel agreeing with God that it was right it's according to God's righteousness it was good for God to keep his word and judge the nation of Israel to bring shame upon them to bring judgment upon them. In verse 12, we see that God confirmed his word by bringing about these promised calamities. God promised there would be destruction on Israel. He brings it for their sin. It happened. Verses 13 and 14, we see that those calamities God had promised in the law of Moses. Again, when they rebelled, God kept his word brought his judgment. Daniel confesses, <clears throat> agrees with God that that was right. That was just. If you remember for the nation of Israel, there are three covenants that God made with the nation. <clears throat> Excuse me. You have the covenant with Abraham, the covenant at Mount Sinai under the law, and then the covenant with David. Now, the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant were unconditional. They were, these were promises from God to Abraham and David and to the nation that God says, I'm going to bring about no matter what you do, right? The covenant under the law was a conditional covenant. There was both blessing and curses in that, in that covenant. If they obeyed, blessings. If they disobeyed, curses. And God's promised judgment upon the nation was curses, exile, overthrow by foreign nations if they sinned. And they did. So this is what Daniel is citing here. He's saying, God, you've been faithful to the covenant you've made to us. And we deserve that judgment. So here, before Daniel ever gets to asking for God's forgiveness, ever gets to asking for his mercy, he confesses and says the same thing about the nation's condition and the rightful judgment of God. He says, it's come upon us. This judgment has come because you're righteous. He agrees with God. So the humble heart of confession not only agrees with God about the seriousness of sin, but it also agrees with God that his promised judgment is right, it's just, it's good. But this leads us to the cross. Because as God's children, we are no longer under judgment. There is no condemnation for us, right? But yet, when we confess our sins, we still agree with God that judgment is the righteous response to our sin. Just praise be to God that judgment did not fall on us. Jesus, when he came, he demonstrated that God's judgment on sin was necessary, just, and good. He wouldn't have come and fulfilled that if it wasn't. In Romans 6.23, we clearly uh, read that the wages of sin is what? Death. We have earned death, judgment, separation from God. This is the judgment that all the way back to Adam and Eve, <clears throat> God had promised to them if they sinned that they would die, be separate from him. Our sin has separated us from a holy God forever in spiritual death. We are under his good wrath and will one day spend eternity in the lake of fire. That's the place of God's eternal judgment for our sin. This is God's good and right response to our sin. 
There's no way that we can save ourselves. But thanks be to God for his mercy, right? For his grace. Because he provided a way of escape from that judgment. Not by simply removing the judgment. He wasn't unrighteous. He didn't say, well, I just, you know, I'm just going to close my eyes. Won't see that sin, right? That wouldn't be righteous. Instead, how did he do that? God the Son, Jesus, took on humanity, humbly took your sins, my sins, upon himself and and endured the full and good judgment of God in our place on the cross, and he died for us. And then he rose again when that was complete, having victory over, over sin and death, and now having eternal life and forgiveness and mercy to give to all who accept that free gift of salvation through repentance and faith. Now, if you've not believed that yet this morning, you can today understand and believe that Jesus and his work on your behalf was for you. It was God's love and mercy, judgment, and it was good that judgment was fulfilled through Christ. Repent, confess, turn away from clinging to your sin and your own Stubborn beliefs and false religions and righteousness and in full faith rest in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And here's the good news then. For all of God's people, for those who are his children, you are no longer under God's judgment. We are fully forgiven. And you say, yes, but we still sin. Yes, while we're here, we still sin. We need a daily cleansing that comes through confession and repentance of sin. Confession that agrees that we deserve shame. We deserve judgment. We confess that. But we know that has been done away with in Christ. We know that we are forgiven in Christ. So confession agrees with God about our sin, but it also agrees with God about his judgment. And for us who are saved, we also rejoice that his judgment has been paid in full by Christ. But there's a third way that our confession of sin must agree with God, and that is it must agree with God about our path, the way we were headed, all right? Really, this point is repentance. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of direction. So if you go back in verse 5, Daniel confesses that the nation had turned aside, right, from God's commands. But now look at verse 13. He says, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, Yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God. We haven't called upon him for mercy. Turning from our iniquities, he says, we haven't turned from our iniquities, and gaining insight by your truth. So Daniel confesses, we have taken the wrong path. And that we need to entreat God for his mercy and turn away from iniquity and sin. We need to turn back to God, right? So genuine, humble confession always leads to genuine repentance. So biblical repentance not only experiences godly sorrow, as we saw in 2 Corinthians 7, it not only confesses sin, but it also agrees with God that a new path needs to be taken. It doesn't just say, God, this is wrong, and and you are right in judgment, and then just keep walking the same way, right? It, It looks at the path ahead and says, I can't keep walking that way. I need to walk a different direction. So it's agreeing with God about his path. And where does that knowledge come from? Well, Daniel says here, it's by gaining insight by your truth. It comes from God again. It comes from his word. The repentant heart turns away from rebellion and willful disobedience and turns to face God and follow him. Think of it like this. You're hiking along a trail. God's path is the the path ahead. Your eyes are looking to him. You're, you're walking straight. You're, you're living and delighting in him and, and living out his righteousness. You're, you're keeping in step with the Spirit, right, from Galatians 5. You're leaving behind the old way of life and unbelief, but then you sin. And you turn aside. And, and in, re- in all reality, you, you actually do, you're, you're going the opposite direction, right? This isn't just a little diversion here. It's not like, well, it'll eventually veer back to the truck. No, you have, you have turned back and now you're headed back towards the old way.
our face, our actions are now moving towards ungodliness. So to repent is to admit that the direction we are facing is error, is wickedness, and deserves judgment. And so we turn to God for mercy, right? We make that about face. We repent of sin. And even before we take that first step, we were forgiven, right? But now we start walking on that path again towards God in full delight in, in who he is, striving to please him in all that we do. So confession agrees with God about the path that we're on, about the path we should be on as well. It turns back toward God. So don't continue down the path of sin and rebellion any longer. When that conviction comes through God's word, through his spirit, using his word, or through a fellow believer that he uses to, to, to make us see our sin, don't continue down that path, right? So the prayer of confession and re- re- repentance there, it really should be a common experience for us as God's people. When we're convicted, we must be quick to confess, turn back to God, cast aside the sin that's easily entangling us, and quick to rest in God's mercy. So confession agrees with God about our sin, about his judgment, about our path, but also about his mercy. So number four, confession agrees with God about his mercy. Verses 9 and 15. So up in verse 9, he says, To the Lord our God belong what? Belong mercy. He's the source of mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. Verse 15. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. So now he gives an example in verse 15 of mercy. So Daniel looks to God alone for mercy, for pity, for his compassion, and for forgiveness. Daniel doesn't make the case and say, well, you know what, God, we've been in exile for 66 years, and and we're we're starting to do better. So so now would be a good time to forgive us. He, He doesn't appeal to the nation's righteousness because they didn't have any. And Daniel didn't even ask God to forgive because Because he was trying really hard. He says, you know, I've been walking with you for a long time, Lord. Would you just be willing to turn back because of me? No, he doesn't say that. Daniel simply asks God to forgive because because God's merciful. There's no righteousness. It wasn't the nation's righteousness. It wasn't Daniel's righteousness. There's nothing that you they could do to to make God be merciful. The the reason why he's asking God to forgive is simply because God's merciful. And God has promised to forgive those who confess and repent. This is helpful for us because we don't have to wait. We don't have to wait until we feel good about ourselves to confess and repent. We don't have to appeal to our good efforts. Like, well, you know what? I'm going to try really hard for the next three days because if I do well enough, God's going to forgive me. No, our forgiveness is not based upon our performance. It's simply based on the fact that we, we have a merciful God. David is an example of this, right? He's the man after God's own heart. And yet he had sinned by committing adultery and murder. And in 2 Samuel eleven twenty seven. 27, We read, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, right? So God, we know, sent Nathan the prophet to confront David in his sin. And David confesses and repents of his sin before the Lord. And that confession is recorded for us in Psalm 51. We read that for our scripture reading. And there in that song, David describes how God does not offer his mercy based upon effort, our effort, or our righteousness, or our good works, but simply because he's merciful. In fact, in fact, God's mercy is received through a humble, contrite heart. Verses 16 and 17 of that psalm say, For you will not delight, Lord, in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So David cast himself on the mercy of God alone. He was going to be forgiven because God was merciful. The verse, first two verses of that psalm say this, Have mercy on me, O God, 
according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. David's forgiveness, your forgiveness, my forgiveness comes from God's mercy alone. Daniel then, here, looks to God's mercy. And he simply reminds God, reminds himself of how God had been merciful in the past. And there in verse 15, he says, God, you are merciful to bring your nation, Israel, out of Egypt. Right? They're in the, they're in the Exodus. Did God do that? Because Israel was just a worthy nation. No. In fact, they had gone to worshiping many of the false gods of the Egyptians at that time. He did it because he was merciful. Was God going to deliver the nation from Babylon because, you know what, they're doing really good now? No, because God is merciful. So this is what we do when we confess. We appeal to the finished work of Jesus, the mercy that God displayed towards us on the cross for our forgiveness today. And here's the promise we have. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. See, as children of God, we are no longer under the condemnation of God. We no longer face any of God's judgment for our sins. So we can confess, we can repent in faith, appealing to the promise of God's mercy, fully knowing that it's already been secured by Christ, that we're already forgiven, that that forgiven will be received. When we we agree with God about our sin, about his judgment, about our path, about his mercy, we rest then in his forgiveness. We have the promise of God that he'll forgive, he'll restore our souls, he'll restore to us the joy of our salvation back to David in Psalm 51, verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. So you know what? The godly grief, the guilt, the shame that comes upon our hearts when we are convicted of our sin, that is good. It, It brings us back to God and to his mercy. But then after we confess and repent, we need no longer feel that guilt and shame. We are forgiven. Uh, Instead, we can rejoice in the mercy of God. We're fully accepted by him. We have been, we always will be. So confession is necessary. Now, I understand that this topic might bring up a couple of questions in your mind about confession and repentance as it does in mind. So I just want to answer a couple of common questions that might, might be there. What about sin that is confessed, repented of, but then I do it again and again and again? Did I truly repent? Right? Did I truly repent of that sin? Now, I can't tell you your heart in every situation, okay? But I can tell you this. If you've agreed with God and, uh, 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 about your sin, about his judgment, you've humbly acknowledged that you're, you were on a sinful path and you've turned back to look to God in his mercy, then yes, you've truly repented. All right? Your face is now again facing God, right? You're forgiven. You've truly repented. But you're like, yes, but there are some sins that I seem to repent all the time and then I sin again. So does that mean that I've not repented? No, you've repented. But what it simply means when you sin again is that, well, you've chose to allow to let that sin reign again. And you've now turned your face back the other direction. So you need to repent again. How often did Jesus tell his disciples to forgive a sin? Right? They're like, how often should we forgive a brother? Seventy times seven. Obviously, not to that point, 490. It was forgive like God forgives. Somebody asks for your forgiveness, forgive them, right? That's what God does. So you repent, confess, repent, God forgives. So there are going to be those sins that seem to really be a struggle for us as we live in the sin-broken world and with that flesh that clings so closely, but we can repent anew because after all, he's already promised that you are fully forgiven in Christ. 
for past, present, future sins. Another question, what do I do when I still feel guilt and shame over past sin? Right? There's some sins in our past each one of us have that probably often we feel guilt and shame over. And maybe they've happened a long time ago. Maybe we've repented of them more times than we even needed to because we've repented once. God's forgiven us. But that guilt and shame is still there. Well, again, the Holy Spirit produces that godly grief, right? That conviction that leads to repentance. But after we have repented, we can fully rest in the joy of our salvation. But our sin nature, others, Satan himself is called the great accuser in the book of Revelation, will accuse us and want us to wallow in guilt and shame. And in those moments, we need to remind ourselves that our sins are forgiven in the promise of Psalm 103.12 that says, As far as from the east and as from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Don't live under that guilt and shame. Right? He's removed that sin. Jesus has already taken that guilt and shame on the cross, and we can walk with confidence that we are no longer guilty. We, are, we no longer bear that shame because of Christ. We're fully accepted before God. Leads to another question. If I repent, will the consequences of my sin be removed? If I repent, will the consequences be taken away? The judgment has been removed. All right, let's start there. The judgment has been removed. You are no longer condemned before God. You are no longer going to face his wrath for, uh, and judgment for that sin. But the physical consequences in this life may remain. David is an example of this, right? After the, one, the consequence of his adultery was that his son was going to die, David was forgiven, but his sin still had consequences. It even affected others. Now, God in his grace and mercy may remove some of those earthly consequences of our sin. And I think if we think critically about our life and the sins that we commit, he often removes many of the consequences of our sin here and now. All right? That's his grace, his mercy. But not always. And in his goodness, in his kindness, and in his wisdom, he sometimes determines that the consequences are to remain as a loving reminder to us and to others of the need to walk in godliness and the seriousness of sin. Those consequences, though, we must be able to identify, those consequences of sin are not God's judgment upon us. Right? There's a difference between his judgment and consequences of sin. Instead, they're a part of God's loving correction and training us in righteousness so that we would be mature and Christ-like. All right? Another question. If my sins are forgiven in Christ, why do I need to confess and repent continually, right? I'm already forgiven in Christ. Remember Jesus' illustration with Peter and the disciples in the upper room? Jesus is washing the disciples' feet. He comes to Peter, and, and, and Peter says, you know, you know, stops him, says, you know, no, you're not going to do this, Lord. When John 13, 8 through 10, Jesus answered him, if I don't wash you, you have no share with me. And so Peter says, well, Lord, not just my feet then, also my hands and my head, right? And Jesus said to him, well, the one who has bathed does not need to be washed. You're clean, except for your feet, you know. So Jesus teaches us that we are already clean. We're already forgiven. But when we sin, we still are turning our back on God and we break that fellowship that we had with him. He hasn't turned his back on us. He's not judging us. We're not under his condemnation. But that fellowship, like in any relationship, that fellowship has been hindered. And, and so we need to be cleansed again. And we need to be put, at, with a loving Father, put us back on the right path, right? We still need to repent and turn our face back to God. And that comes by humbling ourselves through confession. So humility confesses sin that's known, right? And, and then it, and it turns the face back to God. That relationship, that fellowship uh, is, is, or the fellowship is, is restored. The relationship continues. It's always there. We can't break off that relationship if we're truly in Christ. 
So confession humbles us, restores that fellowship with God. So it's necessary to confess and repent as a humble re- response to God. You're already forgiven, but we need that daily cleansing. Final question. Will God forgive me if I miss confessing a sin? <laughs> what if I have sinned and, you know what, I didn't see it in the moment and I never thought to confess it. I've never repented of it. Has God forgiven me? Yes. All right, there's your answer. Yes, you are forgiven in Christ. You are already forgiven in Christ. But humility is the heart attitude that God desires. That's why he desires us to confess our sins. Humility confesses any sin that is known, but also in humility, we rest in God's mercy for any sin that we may have overlooked. Think of it this way. When you came to Christ, perhaps you had, have, you had years, if not decades, of not walking with him. Did you have to repent of every single instance of sin that you had for the last five years, 10 years, 30 years before you came to Christ? No. Right? So the humble heart trusts God to be merciful and to forgive all of our sin, even the ones that we have overlooked, the ones that we have missed. It's only the hard heart of pride that drives that wedge in our fellowship with God. Now, it is, however, a good habit to pray this prayer from David in Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting, right? Pray that sometimes. Lord, reveal to me where I'm sinning so I can confess that and turn my path back to you, relying on your mercy. So when you sin, when conviction comes, confess before God. Agree with God about the vileness of sin, about his righteous judgment, especially through Christ uh, and what Christ accomplished, the, the rebellious nature of your wicked path. Agree with him about that, but also agree with him that his mercy is sweet, that it is full, that it is forgiving. So confess your sins to a merciful God. He will forgive, cleanse, and restore you. Let's pray. Father, we come to you with that humble awe and joy in knowing that we are forgiven. Lord, we come confessing our sins as well. We are sinners. Lord, we can look at our own hearts and see pride. We can see self-seeking. We can see unrighteous anger. We can see lust. We can see um, um, haughtiness. We can see bitterness. We can see... uh, anxiety that hasn't been handed over to you. We can see um, just our unkindness, Lord, and, and, and idolatry and, and, and a host of other sins. And well, Father, we admit that they are vile. They have broken your law. We also admit, Father, that you are righteous, and in your righteousness they deserve to be judged. Lord, with a heart of repentance, though, we turn to you. The path that we are on, we agree, is without you, without any of those sins that we find ourselves walking down a path, that's the wrong way. And we turn back to you in mercy. And we call upon you, not because of our righteousness, not because of what we've done, but Lord, we call upon you to be merciful because you've been merciful to us, because you're a merciful God. And we have seen that because judgment, the good judgment, has been taken in our place by Jesus. So we thank you that we're cleansed. We thank you that we're forgiven. Uh, May we continue to walk with our face towards you in joy and rejoicing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.